welcome to Grant's Meadow for our annual hike. We're supposed to go to Beaver Dam Heath, out onto the heath, but conditions won't allow it. So we're going to do the Upland Loop Trail here. And Eileen Willard here is going to be uh, talking about trees. She's a dendrologist who is at uh, University of New Hampshire and does a lot of volunteer work. We have a plaque here, Grants Meadow, conserved in memory of Ruth uh, Worcester Grayson. When we acquired this property from uh, Bill and Carol Bryant, um, Bill asked us to uh, name it Grants Meadow. He had a 1791, I believe, hand-drawn survey, which um, sort of parceled out areas of the heath and, uh, and uh, for hay fields. So in uh, 1941, apparently, the uh, heath caught fire, the land subsided, so no haying was going on there anymore. <clears throat> so it's a pretty wet environment. So this is Eileen Willard. Um, she's gonna be leading the hike today with, uh, and talking about the trees. Uh, she's a dendrologist uh, at the University of New Hampshire, and I'll let her uh, take it from here. Well, thank you. Uh, uh, I want to clarify, I'm a lab instructor in the dendrology course. The title dendrologist, I, I think, should go to somebody with a PhD in forestry. But anyway, um, I'm happy to be here, and I spent about 15 years teaching students over at the University of New Hampshire as a lab dendrologist. And uh, we would go out on a weekday for four hours in the woods. It was a field course. And they would learn about 120 species of trees and shrubs by the end of it. And, uh, and then I also work at the Wells Reserve. And uh, that's on weekends. So if anybody comes over on a weekend, I'll be sitting in the visitor's center. And I do uh, tree walks for different land trusts in the area. We're seeing quite a few beautiful uh, pines that we have right around here. And we're gonna cover some shrubs and some uh, ground cover, as well as about 10 different trees. So I have a handout for everybody because they probably won't remember 80% of what I say. So I always try to prepare a handout people can review it when they go home. And um, it's going to be a lot of forest ecology. It's not going to be just ID. It's going to be how things interact with each other with some wildlife ecology thrown in too. I want to welcome everybody here to Grants Meadow, uh, about a 200 acre uh, preserve. Great Works Regional Land Trust has on uh, Beaver Dam Heath here in, in Berwick. Um, it's a lovely day. Unfortunately, it's not quite the winter we need to get out onto the heath. We tried doing that the other day. We actually got out there, but we were filling our boots up with water, falling in the water, uh, going through the ice. It was not worth bringing folks out there this year. Uh, Beaver Dam Heath is about a thousand acres of uh, wetlands and uplands um, here in Berwick. Um, it's a uh, home to uh, black racer snakes, landings turtle, uh, spotted turtles, Atlantic white cedar, which we won't be seeing today, unfortunately, and uh, all kinds of other lovely things. We have Eileen Willard here to uh, um, talk about trees and uh, shrubs and uh, ecology. Eileen uh, teaches a dendrology lab at University of New Hampshire and does a lot of volunteering and whatnot, so Eileen. Thank you. Well, welcome, everybody. Happy to see a good turnout. What a gorgeous spring day it is in the middle of fe February. It's a little unnerving, but it's great for walking in the woods. Uh, my name is Eileen Willard, and I am a lab instructor, or I was a lab instructor in uh, dendrology, which is the study of trees at the University of New Hampshire for about 15 years. So uh, today, I prepared a little handout for you because I, I used to have a professor that said, if you do a, a tree walk for the public and they remember four things you said, you've done a good job. <laughs> so I'm not content with just four things. So I think uh, a handout will give you a chance to, when you get home or if you want to do the same trail over again, you'll have like a little roadmap of things to look for. Um, I, 
put down the Latin name of trees in case there are any botanists in the group, but we'll just go by common names. And uh, I put a little description next to each species that's very unscientific, but it's easy to remember. So um, I'll try to point those out as we go along. So this is, uh, first thing I wanted to just talk about is the difference between um, the way trees grow. They're either categorized as opposite or alternate. And the way to uh, visualize alternate is if you have a branch, and uh, maybe I'll just put it, put it here in the snow. Maybe you can see it better. But the buds or the tree branches all go off at different angles. So if I were the tree trunk, this would be one alternate branch and this would be another one. As opposed to opposite, which is when <clears throat> the uh, twig is like this and both branches on either side come out exactly opposite each other. And that's a good way to start when you look at trees to visualize if you're trying to figure out what the identity is. If it's opposite, it's usually only one of two things. It's either an ash tree or a maple tree. They're always opposite. All the other things are alternate. So when you come across something, try to figure out from the newer growth on the tree whether it's opposite or alternate. Had, it, had anyone ever heard of that before? No? Ooh. Okay. <laughs> Yay! So let's start out by looking around and noticing these majestic pines that we have. We have two species of pines just around the parking lot. And one of them is the state tree of Maine. That's uh, that one over there. That's an eastern white pine. And then if you look around like to this one, even though it's a pine tree, it doesn't look like that. First of all, the bark is sort of a different color. It's almost a, has a little pink shading to it. And if you look, the, um, all the foliage is toward the very tips of the branches and it looks like almost a bottle brush effect. So uh, that's a red pine and that's our eastern white pine, which is the state tree of Maine. And so now you know two pines. And this one, if you stripped all the bark off it, it would look like a telephone pole. And I'm guessing that that tree down there, that might have been, that straight up and down tree, that might have been, uh, if it looks like a telephone pole, it probably was a, uh, a red pine. So this is the oldest part. And the very, very top is the newest part of the tree. So it's just gotten rid of all its lower growth that it used to have. There's no point. Those leaves are doing a better job with photosynthesis. They have a better chance at reaching the sunlight. So most trees will grow to reach sunlight. And if they grow in a forest where there's a lot of competition, then there's a big race to go up fast, not put out a lot of lateral branches, but just zoom to the top. Anything that comes off a tree is called, uh, the fruit is called mast. Each little scale like this will hold on its surface two little tiny seeds that have a little wing to them. And what happens when the, when the tree is, when the cone is still up in the tree, these um, scales will kind of open up a little bit and out will drop these little teeny weeny seeds on a, with a little, uh, I don't know, whirly gig or whatever you want to call it behind it. And it, it'll twirl around and wind up hopefully on bare ground somewhere and germinate. So this is uh, one of the other conifers on that list that I have for you on the handout. And uh, this is the Eastern Hemlock. And uh, I think next to it I have something written called Not Good Soldiers. 
<laughs> and the reason I did that was um, it looks, it kind of looks like uh, balsam fir almost. A lot of people get them confused. But the balsam fir needles or leaves are a little bit longer and they're very well behaved. They're always in nice little lines. And when you get to the hemlock, um, every once in a while, if, you know, if you're near one, just kind of grab a lower branch and take a look. If you look, most of the little needles or the little leaves are, you know, kind of lined up on little pegs. But every once in a while, there's, there's one that's going backwards. And <laughs> I don't know, it's just, they're very quirky that way. But you don't see that on a, on a balsam fir. All the needles are probably, you know, they're just kind of regimented and, and orderly. And then you get to the hemlock and you see some that are upside down every once in a while, some that are pointed in some kind of crazy direction. So that's a clue that you're looking at a hemlock rather than a balsam fir. And um, one of the other people in the group turned it over, which is a habit that a lot of us have when we are looking for an invasive insect called um, the hemlock woolly adelgid, which is a little scale-like uh, insect that sucks on the, only the bottom branches underneath, you know, excuse me, not, not the bottom branch, but if you turn the leaf over, you'll only find them on this side, not the top side, but the bottom side. And they are very specific and they suck the, um, all the nutrients and, and the sap out of the hemlocks and the hemlock will eventually die from that. There's a whole bunch of them down at Mount A that, that, have, that are no longer uh, surviving and some over at or Oris Falls also, which is a great works. Uh, so it's coming up from a s more southern part of the United States where the hemlock woolly adelgid has really decimated hemlock trees brutally so that it's changed the whole forest landscape in some of the southern states and now now we've got it in um, York County and parts of Maine which we were hoping to avoid because we have cold winters and if you have really cold winters and you have a succession of days that are very 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 cold it will limit the survivability of those little tiny um, scale insects so we were hoping that it wouldn't come up to Maine. But with our warming temperatures in the winter and you know February days that feel like April, uh, there's, there's no limit <laughs> on, on, it's not a limiting factor on the growth of these little tiny insects. So they are spreading north and they are going to change the way our forests look. So that's the sad part about hemlock woolly adelgid and the reason that anybody that's ever looked for them always will pass a, a tree and then go like this and see if you see any little, like they'll look like little white fuzzy things and they'll be all along the little, the twig part. Not on the outer leaf part, but on the twig part, right where it joins the leaf. So well, luckily, thank goodness, I don't see any here. And we have really a lot of beautiful hemlocks in this forest, really pretty. So um, if this tree were old enough to have, to be able to reproduce and have cones, the cones on the um, hemlock would be on the very tip. So if there's a little tiny cone on the very tip of the tree, you've got a hemlock. And most of the time, if you touch the, the leaves, they're pretty soft, so they're, it's not unpleasant to touch them. And they kind of, they, sometimes the leader of the tree will actually turn in the direction that the wind has blown it. But you can't always go like, you can't always go by that if you're, it's better to just have a compass out in the woods <laughs> rather than rely on the bark on the tree. Oh, we, we have uh, spruce trees oh. over here. Oh, good. So we can make a good comparison. So that's a red spruce. There are several different spruces in Maine. They basically the hint with spruces is where is it living, okay? It's on the top of a mountain or in a bog, it's a black spruce probably. If it's just growing in the woods like this and doesn't quite get to the top of a mountain, it's probably a red. And then we have a white spruce, but they're generally northern and I don't see any down here unless they're planted. 
So you just have to think red spruce or black spruce. And we're, we're not in a bog um, and we're not on a mountaintop. So that's a pretty good hint that this is a red spruce, as shiny needles, shiny leaves. Okay, I'm using that term interchangeably. So, but these are leaves just like there are leaves on any other kind of tree, deciduous tree, drops their leaves, evergreens keep their leaves. Yeah. I don't know what the history of this parcel is right here, whether it was ever pasture land or... I suspect it was Yeah, pasture. I suspect it was too. And so all these trees have grown up around it, but this, this little bunch of juniper, it's now it's, it's not doing too well because it's not getting enough, enough sunlight the way it used to when it was out in a field. But it's usually an indication that they had sheep here that ate, the ate everything else but didn't touch this. So <laughs> this is juniper, common juniper. And um, it's, uh, it's not pleasant to touch. And when you turn it over, it's got a white, kind of a white streak underneath the, the leaf. The sheep would, uh, if, if the farmer had a bunch of sheep in a field, they'd eat everything, but they wouldn't eat this because this doesn't taste good and it's spiky. This is um, one of the ground covers that I mentioned in our handout. It's sheep laurel. And I think the easy way to remember it is that they're little sort of semi-evergreen leaves and they droop down like a little sheep's tail. That's all I can think of, a little lamb's tail. See those little capsules? hanging down. Those are considered fruits also. Those are what happens when a flower matures and uh, the, these are just little seed capsules that are left. I need to really say something about buds, okay? Because this is always the, the oh wow moment of any tree walk. The buds that you see on bushes and any tree that you want to look around here there's a, how convenient, a nice beech tree right here. And if you'll notice, I'll put my glove there. Do you see these little pointy things right here and here and here? By the way, it's alternate branching. These, I, I refer to these as little brown cigars on 45 degree angles. If you find that, you've got a beech tree. This is an American beech. It still has a lot of leaves on it from uh, last summer. It doesn't like to drop its leaves right away. But let's get back to buds. The buds are on the trees that we see in the springtime. We think they pop out. They don't pop out. They've been there since last June or July. So when the tree has plenty of sunlight for photosynthesis and growth, that's when they do their reproduction and they set their buds for next year. And then the buds go into sort of a dormant state. They don't usually pop out. They just stay there. They winter through and they're protected from all the elements by the scales that are on them. And then in the spring, when the temperature is right and when there's enough daylight, hours of daylight, the photo period, then they start to drop those little scales. And inside every little bud on this tree, each little you know, cigar that I mentioned is in miniature, folded up and in embryonic form, the leaves, all the leaves and the flowers, everything is packed into those little buds in some kind of sort of embryonic form. And if you come out here, you know, in maybe May or June, when they really start to open up, they'll open up like accordions with pleats. It's so neat to see it and it changes radically from day to day with the warmer temperatures and the lots of sunlight coming in and um, it's just unbelievable. So when I took dendrology in 2003 at University of New Hampshire after a long career in corporate America, I had a lot of fun when I left <laughs> and I went back to school and I took dendrology and um, 
I remember the professor saying something that we're going to identify, it was in the fall, we're going to identify 120 species of trees and shrubs by their buds. And I thought, buds? What is she talking about? There aren't any buds. And then I realized, you know, with the course, that yeah, the buds are there. And they're there in the fall. And when we had to take our final exam in December, we weren't going to be able to rely on the leaves, which is what you do when you take the Girl Scout badge. You know? <laughs> so yes, buds are there. If you want to wow some of your neighbors at a cocktail party or whatever, challenge them. Say there are buds on the trees that are there from last summer, and they're not going to open up until this spring. This is, these are the remnants of a chestnut tree. Oh my God. Yeah. So it's a you know, Native American chestnut growing out here, only reaching a certain height because it's been attacked by the chestnut blight. A long time ago, um, chestnut trees were common, more than common, from Maine all the way down to Georgia and, and a little to the west. And there's always the, uh, the legend that I like to promote that if a squirrel jumped on a chestnut tree in Maine, it could go all the way to Georgia without ever touching the ground just by jumping to the next chestnut tree. That's how many chestnut trees. We had billions and billions of chestnut trees in the eastern United States. And along came a, uh, um, the blight, which is, I believe a fungal fungal disease that came in on an imported chestnut tree from I think Asia and I think it was at the uh, Brooklyn Botanical Gardens <laughs> that they planted this this tree again from another country so maybe in Asia where it was growing there were other organisms or conditions that limited the growth of the blight so that their trees weren't unduly affected. But when you transplant something from another continent and you put it here, nothing around here has ever co-evolved to limit the, uh, the extent of the damage that can be done. And that's what happened with chestnuts. So the root system is still viable and it's putting up um, this part is dead, but this is a new shoot that's coming up from the uh, root system. And it, it probably isn't going to get too much bigger. And then for some reason, the blight attacks it, and they never get to be really big trees. It would be nice to find a really big chestnut tree, but um, this, the, like, there are two of them over at UNH, way in the back, in the natural area that are about this big, and they don't seem to have been attacked by the blight, so good, that's great. But it's, the, it's a, an exception to the case. Most chestnut trees, you can find remnants of them in, in a lot of different forests, but they're not, they're not doing real well. But they do have um, very big, long leaves, and it looks a lot like a beech leaf. And so on my handout, I put down beech leaves on steroids which is in the summer you can take a beech leaf and a and a chestnut leaf the beech leaf will probably be about this big but that's a pretty big mildly toothed leaf leaf so that's a good indication i'm really happy to see that there's some chestnut out here and it, it would be great if by some quirky situation that it actually was able to continue living and uh but the chances are the blight is already at work at, on some of this, and it will be like this in, in a while. I think you can uh, see some oh. of the uh, fruiting uh, bodies, of, oh, uh, these yeah. little red orange spots on yeah. the uh, bark. Yeah. That's uh, spreading yeah. the... Uh, spreading the spores. Yeah. Yep. Looking back of you, you've got all these beautiful young hemlock trees regenerating underneath these other things. Hemlock trees don't need a heck of a lot of sun. So every tree species 
can, um, is determined to need a certain amount of sunlight. And these are fairly um, shade, what, what are called shade tolerant trees. And so they can gener regenerate under the shade of other trees. And that is a beautiful sight to see all those young hemlocks coming up. And then you see these big giant ones, which obviously, if you went higher up, and if it was the right time of year, maybe we'd see little cones on the ends of all the branches. Obviously, all those seedlings have come from these larger ones that are nearby. But if you look underneath this area, you'll notice there's not a lot of snow here. And this is perfect um, type of habitat for our, our deer population. They seek out areas like this that are not loaded with snow because they have what's called an energy budget, just like all of us. So they seek out hemlock forests and, and balsam fir forests and any place that the trees can snow, what's called snow load. They can carry a lot of snow on them and underneath them, it's kind of bare almost. And the other thing is that uh, when you've got a lot of big trees like that, that sort of put a canopy over the land, it holds the warmth in from the daylight so that in the, at night, in the winter, the temperature here is gonna be warmer than it would be out in a field. It holds, holds the warmth, so that benefits the the deer population and other animals too. Who wants to say what it is? Beech, beech American beech. And the leaves, see they look like the chestnut leaf. They're not quite as big and long as the chestnut, but that one's pretty big. But these are little beech trees and I think what's happened here is that uh, they can grow up in an area where they don't have to have a terrible amount of sunshine either. So they're a far, they can grow up to be big forest trees. Yeah, I just uh, wanted to bring people down here. We're coming off the uh, upland where the uh, pines and the hemlocks are growing down to the uh, wetlands here. This would be, I suppose you could call it a red maple swamp, but this is where it gets kind of wet and uh, impassable. This is why we're not going out to see the uh, Atlantic white cedars, but it's an interesting transition. You get out there, it's pretty flat. Um, it's growing up to a lot of alders. It's much, much uh, more dense than when I started coming out here maybe 10 years or so ago. And, uh, but it's, a, it's an interesting place. So I just wanted to show people uh, from the wetland, uh, the highland to the uh, lower wetlands down here. Down here in this with some bigger ones. This little area down here is referred to as a witch's broom. <laughs> it does look like a broom in a way. And it's actually, I mean, it's, it's um, plant material from the original blueberry plant. It's just that something happened to it, some sort of irritation, and the hormonal uh, response was to send out an abundance of extra growth in a very, you know, kind of goofy looking way. This parcel of land was abandoned as whatever the use it was being used for, you know, grazing or whatever. When they stopped doing that, all the seeds from the local trees on the perimeter blew in here and you get a forest where most of these trees are like, the, the, certainly all the white pines are the same age. They all just blew in the same time and took off and raced to the, to the sunlight as fast as they could go. If there were a lot of lower branches, it would be indicative of what's called a pasture tree, where a farmer would leave one tree out in the pasture to provide shade for the animals. But these things, this is just, I mean, foresters love trees like this because they're straight and tall and they're easy to use and cut and turn into lumber. And so the, the, the kind of tree that they would leave out in a pasture would have a lot of lower branches and just a ton of branches. And it would be shaped very differently. They'd still be eastern white pines, 
but they would have a different growth habit. <laughs> Burnt potato chip bark. Oh. <laughs> That's how you describe it. People don't forget that. This is a black cherry tree. And, um, and they grow in kind of a snaky fashion. Um, this is one of the straighter ones I've ever seen. Most of them are very tortured looking. But if you see, if you see these flakes, you know, and they have some little lines through them, like birches almost, um, that's a cherry tree, black cherry, native to the area. Birds love it, provides plenty of little fruits for them. I'm look, trying to look at the lobes on the leaves that are, that are left. And they look like they're rounded lobes. So rounded lobes on an oak tree would make it a white oak. Pointy lobes would make it a red oak probably back here. But uh, white oaks, that's good addition. These trees can live a long time. And it looks like a number of them are moving in now. So someone asks, well, what, what would happen, you know, if a lot of the hemlocks died here? And I think the answer is, that you'd get a lot more oak trees coming in. They do like sunlight. So when tr other trees go down and have an opening in the canopy and you get more sunlight hitting the ground, you're gonna get more oak trees coming up. So there's a whole bunch of little ones coming up in here, which is nice to see. So they're in the same family as the beech trees. Again, the young ones don't seem to know how to drop their leaves, so. So well, folks, uh, well, thank everybody for coming, and thank you, Eileen, for my pleasure for entertaining us with your talk. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, if folks want to see what Beaver Dam Heath looks like, there's a nice aerial there. It'll show uh, most of it. The Heath is being um, uh, threatened by, uh, you know, encroachment. There's a lot of development going on, a lot more clear cutting that's been going on. Uh, Great Works Regional Land Trust has been really fortunate to be able to protect this, and we're hoping to be able to protect more of it. And um, so I just want to thank everybody. If you're interested in conserving wonderful places like this, join Great Works Regional Land Trust. Uh, we're doing the conservation work in our communities and uh, uh, we need all the help we can get. So thank you very much. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. your name, please. I'm Sharon Morrill. And Diane Potter. Where are you from? Kittery. Kittery, yeah. And your thoughts on today's show? It was fascinating. Yeah. She was full of information. Mm -hmm. It was very interesting, and she explained things in a way that were, was very easy for anyone to understand so it was interesting I really enjoyed it and I'm definitely going to do some more of these land trust walks yeah. and I learned things about stuff that's on my property that I didn't even know what some right. of the plants and some of the trees were so it's very interesting yeah